All right, good evening. I'd like to call to order the regular city council meeting for the Lakewood City Council in Lakewood, Colorado on May 9th, 2022 at 7 o'clock p.m. For those calling in this evening, that phone number is going to be 720-707-2699, webinar ID of 849-5732-0840. You'll press pound twice. And then if you wish to speak, which you're happy, you're welcome to do that now, press star nine, and then we'll ask you to unmute with star six. With that, will the clerk please call the roll? Paul? Here. Abel? Here. Franks? Here. Jensen? Here. Mayot Guerrero? Here. Vincent? Here. Over? Shah Razai? Here. Springsteen? Here. Stewart? Here. Strom? Here. You have a quorum. Great, thank you. Well, I appreciate everybody coming out this evening in chambers and those who are attending online. And with that, we'll please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for a moment of silent prayer. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, please be seated. All right, just quickly read our statement, a conflict of interest. All members of the city council have the responsibility to comply with the terms of Charter 7.2 print B and excuse themselves from voting on any matter in which they determine they have a personal, financial, or business interest. The city council is empowered by Charter 7.2B to uh, agree by unanimous vote excluding the member at issue to excuse any member of the council from voting on a matter in which they determine such member has a personal financial or business interest <laughs> so moving right along to public comment this is the point in the meeting where the public is invited to address the city council on items that did not appear on the agenda all comments should be directed to the city council i ask for uh, decorum in both chambers and those calling in to speak, if you haven't had a chance to sign up in chambers, please do so in the back. If you'd like to raise your hand to speak online, go ahead and do that now. Uh, star nine to request to speak. Those speaking here in person, there is a uh, three minute time limit. When your time's at two and a half minutes, the little light down here will go yellow. When your time is up, it'll go red. For those folks online, when you're at 30 seconds, you'll hear, when your time is up, you'll hear, and I will acknowledge that we have one comment via Lakewood Speaks, I think, for public comment related to water use and water restrictions and storage. And I think um, Councilor Stewart's going to address that in general business or something along those lines. All right, first up, looks like we have a pooling for Lenore, and that's Jerry, Robert, and Katie. Good evening, Council. On April 1st, the Denver Post printed an article about the CCU lawsuit, including this quote from Mayor Paul, and I quote, the city is prepared to enforce the ruling of the court if the city becomes aware of any violations of this ordinance, unquote. My efforts to get code enforcement to act on reported violations in a timely manner while students were still present in university-owned residences failed in spite of my diligent efforts for over a month. On March 31st, I phoned in a complaint to code enforcement, and on April 4th, this was followed by a written complaint. Three days later, I received a generic response from Gail Spencer, the code enforcement coordinator, stating, and I quote, your concern is being investigated and the appropriate steps will be taken, unquote. There was no information providing a case number or the name of an investigative officer. 
I found this concerning because once school ended and the students moved out, no violation would be cited. I sent another email to Ms. Spencer, but weeks went by with no response. I contacted both my city councilors to see if they could obtain further information about the status of my complaint. Finally, out of frustration, I finally filed a CORA request on May 2nd. By now, the school year was coming to an end, and I learned that there was no current code enforcement information regarding the properties mentioned in my complaint. This meant that there was no official documentation of the city notifying or citing CCU for their ordinance violations. As of March 23, 2022, when Judge Klein made his ruling, CCU was in violation of the ordinance by housing students in university-owned properties in R1, R2 zones. The city should have officially cited CCU after my complaint was filed and told them that they would not be permitted to house students in these duplexes moving forward. Could it be that the city never investigated my claims at all? The students would not have suffered because the school would have had 30 days to comply and by then summer break would have started. On May 3rd, Ms. Spencer finally sent me an email saying, and I quote, the city is still in contact with CCU to determine their plans to move forward regarding student housing after the school year ends in May 2022, unquote. This statement has raised several questions. What kind of contact is the city having with CCU? Why hasn't the city made an official notification to CCU to enforce the court ruling and its own ordinance? It was recently discovered that one of the students living in the uh, duplex next to me was planning on returning to the same address when school resumes in the fall. Evidently, CCU has no plans for future compliance. So what plan does the city have to, present, to prevent CCU from moving students into the disputed residential units? Just how is the city planning to communicate with CCU to let them know that they cannot violate our ordinance? How do you plan to enforce this? So many questions, yet no answers provided. The significance of code enforcement's failure to officially cite CCU for their violations in April and early May is that as soon as the university chooses to return students to these duplexes, an illegal act, by the way, new complaints will have to be filed and the process begins all over again. Sadly, it seems that the city is more interested in enabling CCU to circumvent the law than they are in enforcing it. The process for obtaining information regarding complaints is seriously flawed. The individual who is filing the document is provided with vague, go-away phrases from code enforcement with no follow-up regarding a specific resolution. I can only hope that this policy is not deliberate. Thank you very much. All right, next under general public comment, Dolores Moya. I'm going to forfeit, thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. All right, anybody else in chambers which wish to speak under general public comment? Okay. Anybody online wish to speak under general public comment? Please raise your hand, star nine. Okay, I will close public comment and certainly thank uh, Lenore and the group for coming and certainly know that we'd enforce the rules as they are and I don't have any other update other than um, uh, if there's something that comes to light, we'll let you know. Next up is the consent agenda. 
The consent agenda has been made to expedite council action. It contains both resolutions and first reading ordinances. Resolutions are items of a routine nature. Members of the public will have an opportunity in a moment to comment on any of the proposed resolutions. Uh, it doesn't look like there's any first reading ordinances, so we'll disperse with that. Any council member may request an item on the consent agenda be removed for separate discussion and action under general business. Will the clerk please read the items on the consent agenda into the record? The consent agenda consists of items six through eight. Item six, resolution 2022-35, appointment of members to the Lakewood Advisory Commission. Item seven, resolution 2022-36, establishing projects and project funding levels for the 2022 Capital Improvement and Preservation Program, CIPP, Neighborhood Participation Program. Item eight, approving minutes of city council meeting, special meeting April 4th, 2022, and special meeting April 26, 2022. Thank you. I'll now open the public hearing. Um, Ms. Hasford, you have signed up to speak on the consent agenda. Yes, you did. <laughs> Aren't you? <laughs> well, I thought maybe you were supporting a project in your neighbor, but all right. So, she may not know that this is it. Anybody else wish to speak on the consent? Okay. Um, so I'll ask for a motion on the consent, and then I'll go to councilor comments and questions. Okay. Mayor Paul, I move for approval of city council minutes and for adoption of resolutions, all of which are included in the consent agenda items introduced into the record by the city clerk. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Councilor Stewart. Thank you. I just wanted to speak on item seven and just disclose that I am a member of one of the neighborhood associations whose project has been selected, um, but I deliberately was not a part of the application process in any way, shape, or form, but just wanted to disclose that publicly. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Councilor Abel. A um, couple of things, Mayor. Firstly, one of the comments tonight regarded uh, some, I'm sorry, uh, one of the uh, comments tonight regarded uh, re on this matter uh, seemed to address a program at Stober Elementary for CDBG and I didn't see that on the list. So we have Roger Wadnell here, who is our planning manager. Um, I'm, so can you tell me more about your question? Uh, on Lakewood Speaks, there's yes. a comment uh, about the planned improvements at the community garden at Stober. At Stober. Did, can you is that a, should, was that just confusion and maybe meant Slater? Because I know, there's a Slater it's, item on the agenda. I'll try to. Um, the Good evening. Well, I can only speak to the project for the neighborhood participation program, I, and it's for Slater Garden, Slater Elementary School. I'm not, I'd have to do check on the CDBG item if there's a difference, but this one is for Slater. Right, right. But so the comment was clearly, okay. So uh, no, no, there, no, there Council. There must have been some confusion. Uh, I think last year there was, there was a project funded I think it referenced that yes. project as to the success of the outdoor playground at Stober, which I think tied into the Slater project for support. Okay, I think Ross Williams can address that if you'd like. Here we go. <laughs> Mr. Williams, good evening. Thanks, Mr. Waddell. Yeah, thanks, Council. Uh, there was a project last year approved for Stober Elementary. And those uh, we've contracted with the school district to perform those uh, th those pr two projects. There's one at Stober and one at uh, Green Gables Elementary, and they have not been completed. So we are working to get with the school district to get those completed as soon as we can this year. Okay. They were funded. They were funded last year out of the NPP program, not a block grant or anything like that. It was sure. just a, a, well, well, 
then this must be a mistake. This person said, I strongly support the Stober Elementary School Garden Outdoor Classroom and the NPP in general. So, thank yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, it was left. Okay. Councilor Franks. Thanks, Mayor Paul. I just wanted to read into the record uh, for the section of the consent agenda about the Lakewood Advisory Commission and just wanted to acknowledge the folks that we're putting forth. Is that the right time now? I just didn't want to. Oh, absolutely. Please. Oh, okay. So I just wanted to acknowledge and certainly say that our uh, screening committee, we always are so, um, it's it's so uplifting to see all the folks who are wanting to volunteer for our community. And I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the three people that we are recommending to be put forth for the Lakewood Advisory Commission, uh, Glenda Sinks, um, Karen Sweeney Tucker and Marie Venner. So just wanted to read their names into the record and say we, we are looking forward to your contributions on the LAC. Thank you. Okay, Councilor Sharazai. Yes, uh, thanks to Councilwoman Franks for reading those names in the record. I, I can imagine that at least one other counselor up here would agree that Ward 1 comes up showing strong again. Two out of three of these um, individuals are from Ward 1, and so just really proud of the response the community had to uh, the request to join the LIC and looking forward to getting to work with this group more closely. All right, so that exhausts the comments. There's a motion in a second. Please cast your votes on the consent. Uh, Mayor? Yes, sir. Is this only on the screening committee? No, sir. I want to break out a couple of items for discussion. Oh, okay. So you mean you want to have, you want to do a separate vote on the? No, I want to break out items nine and 10 from the consent agenda. Move them to general business for discussions. They're not on the consent agenda. They're not? Just items seven and eight. Six, seven, and eight, forgive me. Okay. So just to refresh, on the consent agenda, 2022-35, uh, appointment of members of the Lakewood Advisory Commission. Uh, item 7, 2022-36 is the projects for um, the 2022 capital improvement. And then item eight, proving minutes of city council meetings, April 4th, April 26th. So, okay, I'm gonna clear these, one second, Councilor Springsteen, I'm gonna clear these votes. Uh, Councilor Springsteen. I just, I wonder, we're voting on all three at once because if we don't want to approve the minutes, how, how, how do we do that? Yeah, certainly. Separate? So any member uh, can pull any item from the consent agenda. So if you want to pull that item, please let me know. I, I do, please. Okay. The minutes, yeah. Okay, so let's remove the motion the second, please. I remove my second. I remove the motion. Okay, and I'll ask for a motion on uh, items six and seven, resolutions 2022-35 and 2022-36. Okay. Mayor Paul, I move for approval for the adoption of resolutions 2022-35 and 2022 36, all of which are included in the consent agenda items introduced into the record by the city clerk. Is there a second? Okay, motion and second. Any more discussion? Please cast your votes. And can somebody please vote for Councillor Meja Guerrero and Springsteen? Yes. Okay. And that passes 10 ayes, zero nays. Thank you. And we'll go ahead and put item eight under general business. I'd like to congratulate the folks that were uh, willing to serve on the Lakewood Advisory Commission. We certainly appreciate your time and effort and hopefully we're gonna have some great things coming your way soon. Clerk, please read item nine. 
Item 9, Resolution 2022-37, approving a Chapter 14.27 blight designation pursuant to Chapter 14.27 of the Lakewood Municipal Code for the property located at 1325 J Street in Lakewood, Colorado. Okay. Um, before we open this public hearing, I just want to acknowledge that we've had a few of these in the past, and certainly uh, council members can feel passionate. I would remind the council that this is a process that the legislative body has created, and I encourage all members to uh, be respectful of the presenters and the guests here tonight who are just simply following our process that is in place. With that, I believe Mr. Smith has a presentation. I do, Your Honor. Thank you very much for uh, taking some time on the agenda tonight to uh, uh, work with this. Uh, before the Council is uh, Resolution 2022-37. It's concerning a uh, Chapter 1427 blight designation consideration for the property at 1325 J Street. It's very uh, commonly known as Lakewood Brick. Uh, we do have a presentation from the uh, consultant on the uh, on the project. Unfortunately, they weren't able to be with us today in chambers. Um, they had a couple of folks in their office that had uh, COVID and they didn't want to take uh, out of an abundance of caution, did not want to be here. So Patrick Challen is, I believe, in the audience in there. And so if there's an ability to move him up into the, Great. Uh, the top. Looks like we, we have moved him over. Mr. Challen, good evening. Well, there you go. I will allow Mr. Shellen to uh, go through the main points of the blight study here in just a moment. Hey, he's with Matrix Design Group. As you know, Matrix Design Group is one of the uh, nationally recognized uh, blight consultant firms in the uh, country and uh, are very knowledgeable with the urban renewal process here in the city of Lakewood. Um, the 1427 blight designation process is very similar to the urban renewal blight designation process, but they're two separate processes. Though the process is the same, the outcomes are very different. And certainly we can spend some more time talking about that if we would like to uh, down the road. I do have some things in the notes that will that will help that out. Um, the condition survey, uh, often known as the blight study, was in the uh, packet. And so hopefully you had a chance to review that information on there. Um, the staff report that comes with this particular item. Um, it references uh, council resolutions 2020-7 and 2024 uh, dash, I'm sorry, 2020-24. Um, there are uh, council approved resolutions, resolutions that help to define blight for the purposes of chapter 1427. Just to put that into a little bit of context, 1427 is where in the code the strategic growth initiative was placed. So the ordinance that was voted on by the public was placed in there under that chapter heading. So 1427 is that chapter. Um, in the middle of the staff report, there's a, a table that has 11 items items. It's on the top of page two. Uh, it goes through the process that was established in order to do a 1427 blight designation. Uh, I won't run through all of them, but all of those need to be answered in the affirmative. And with that table, you can see that all of them were answered yes. I'll, I'll hit a couple of them here just to, to give you a feel for it. But for example, uh, was the condition survey conducted in strict alignment with the criteria and methodology required for the state statute determination of a blighted area? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. Uh, another one that's on that list, uh, where the property owners informed that council's 1427 blight determination would sunset in a defined number of years. And the answer to that is also yes. In the resolution that you have before you, um, there's a five-year timeline that's on that one. Um, and I'll just hit uh, maybe one more here. Uh, Let's see, where the property owners inform that the council, uh, the council will determine whether the property owners have purposefully blighted the property by failing to reasonably care for the property, keep the property safe, secure, sanitary, and good repair, or have otherwise failed to comply with the zoning requirements of the Lakewood Municipal Code. And of course, the answer to that is yes as well. Um, the consultant's report indicates that there are seven state-defined uh, elements that exist on the property that's sufficient for a 1427 blight designation to be conferred. The minimum is four. Um, there's also a table on there that identifies what those seven, seven are. There's 11 characteristics in the state statute. And again, I won't go over all of them, but um, one may be the uh, defective or inadequate street layout. That's a condition that was there, unsanitary or unsafe conditions, um, defective and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, deteriorated or deteriorating structures. Those are just a few of the ones that the, the consultant will address a little bit uh, further. The property currently has multiple industrial and flex buildings on the site as a business, outdoor storage, uh, machinery, vehicle storage, office space, asphalt, and additional industrial type uses on the site currently. 
Um, the project that would eventually take its place um, is exploring some potential redevelopment opportunities that would follow the current zoning regulations and the city code. Um, and the project could bring about uh, additional development, added infrastructure, potential neighborhood serving amenities and jobs. Sites located near, near various modes, uh, excuse me, various modes of transportation, including RTD routes, bike routes, that sort of thing. The study area is adjacent to the established Lakewood West Colfax Urban Renewal Area or the Lakewood Reinvestment Area uh, that's on West Colfax. Um, the Lamar Station stop is adjacent to this property as well. The, the West Line runs out here. Property is on the 40 West Art Line, which as you know is a four mile walking and biking cultural asset in the city of Lakewood. The amenity has a strong community support and, and uh, work with all of those property owners along there to keep that, uh, that uh, Art Line moving and grooving. The study uh, area is located within a Colorado Enterprise Zone. That that's a state defined area um, of where there is some uh, tumult or uh, difficulty. And so that tries to establish a business friendly environment under that Colorado Enterprise Zone uh, statute. And this property is within that. It's also within a federal opportunity zone, which is a federal designation for uh, uh, difficult properties or challenged properties. These properties are located uh, within a CDBG area and a low income housing tax credit area or LIHTC area. Study areas to, again found to have seven of 11 blight factors. Uh, the presence of at least four is required. I mentioned that earlier and I'll mention it again. Uh, the description of each blight factor is included in that blight study report uh, and a summary of each of those blight findings is also included in that blight report that uh, came with the packet. I'll quickly point out that uh, if the property does receive a 1427 blight designation, it won't change the zoning or grant additional zoning uh, entitlements at all. Properties will still have to develop under their zoning if they, if they move forward and develop. Uh, I did review the Lakewood Speaks website a little earlier today. Public comment there was closed about noon, so I looked at it just uh, afternoon. There were 32 comments on the uh, on that uh, mechanism, uh, 29 commenters. A couple of commenters uh, commented a couple of times. Um, essentially, two of the commenters directly were not in support of the blight designation. 17 were in direct support of the blight designation, and then there were 10 more that were in support of redevelopment without directly stating a position on the blight. Um, uh, whether blight designation made sense or not. So um, you'd have to interpret that, and I, I won't interpret that on their behalf, but just so you know, that those other 10 comments are there. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, the applicant team is here. Uh, the development uh, team is over here. Reed Davis, uh, Jim Welty uh, are in the uh, audience tonight. And then Patrick Chellen is the consultant for Matrix. And we'll put him up on the screen here in just a second. Um, and again, it was conducted by Matrix um, uh, design group. Um, and as an FYI, that's the same group that does, uh, did the study for the 2005 blight designation for the whole of the Colfax corridor. So when in 2005, we did that whole Colfax corridor, Matrix was the design group that was on that particular project. So without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll introduce Patrick Chellen with Matrix Design, let him go through the, uh, the report for you, and then we'll be happy to come back here and answer any questions you may have at that time. So with that, I'll sit down for just a moment, and Patrick is on the screen to uh, present the rest of that report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Good evening, Mr. Chellen. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for that great introduction. I'll um, start off with a couple of things, if I may. Let's see if I can share my screen here. Make sure. Okay, so as uh, Robert just uh, described very well, we're first looking at the uh, project here on uh, J Street, which is the Summit Brick Company. It's this 11 and a half acre parcel that you can see, on, hopefully you can see on my screen. And then I've got a little presentation uh, for this one, or a blight study. Okay. All right, so this is the 1325 J Street, which as I mentioned is an 11 and a half acre site that is located along 14, just north of the light rail um, between Lamar, I guess it's one parcel away from Lamar and does have some frontage to Harlem Street. And so um, I think everyone's aware of the, the process that we're going through and the exception that is allowed for within the 1% growth cap, but this slide just discusses that. And then there is this blight exception, which is what we were reviewing under 
um, and the, the exception is that if structures located are to be located upon land as des land that is designated blight. And so um, here's the Colorado urban renewal statues and the determination of the study that matrix prepared was to um, determine if this uh, parcel did meet these urban renewal statues of blight or not. So as Robert said, there are 11 factors of blight that we reviewed for, and these are the 11 here. I won't read them all to, uh, to you tonight. And we found seven of those blight factors as we reviewed this parcel and the structures. So I'm just gonna go through the seven that we reviewed, or found rather. Uh, the first one was the slum, deteriorated or deteriorating structures. So on the screen here are six different pictures of the the building that is on the side are buildings, and it, it highlights broken windows, uh, foundations that are starting to crumble. Some would suggest this chimney here is starting to fall apart a little bit. So pretty rundown buildings that have probably worked great for what the use is today, but are really deteriorating um, in, in place here today. The next one we found was the predominance of defective or inadequate street layout. And so right now there's a singular point of access off of 14th for an 11 and a half acre site. And for, for something like this to really um, have, have adequate street layout, there'd probably be some introduction of grid that comes into this and some other streets and utilities. Um, 14th does not currently have sidewalks or pedestrian um, refuse along there. There's no curb and gutter. Uh, the current roadway or right of way is less than 50 feet and per the Lakewood standards, <clears throat> excuse me, the right of way for 14 should be eight, uh, 78 feet. And then Lamar on the west here and Harlan are both designated as collectors and neither one meet those standards today. The next white factor that we found was a faulty lock layout in relation to size, adequacy, accessibility, or usefulness. And so many of the, much of the site is, is inaccessible due to the ditch that is out there today that comes off of uh, underneath RTD here. And then there is a lot of storage and other areas that just prevent this um, really from being utilized. The next one was the unsanitary or unsafe conditions. Part of this is the, the 14th Street that we talked about, Harlan and Lamar, those are challenged. A lot of the site, as you can see in this picture on the bottom right, is within a flood zone, as well as there's um, a large homeless encampment that is in this uh, drainage culvert, which is the kind of southeast corner here that uh, recently had a fire. You can see evidence of that here on the um, picture on the bottom left. The next blight was deterioration of site or other improvements. This is not too different than the building review, but as we walked around the site and did our evaluation, we could see inadequate drainage. We could see uh, fences that were falling down. You can see that in both these pictures here. A lot of storage, uh, tall storage. So just not, uh, well, just the, the blight was evident to us. Um, the next one was the unusual topography or inadequate public improvement or utilities. Again, it's an 11 and a half acre site that's just bound on one side by a public street. No real utilities exist within the site itself. No curb and gutter on 14th, no sidewalks. Lots of loose material, as well as this ditch that I made reference of, which has pretty minimal stormwater protection today. Uh, the next one we found was environmental contamination of buildings or property. There was a known leaking underground storage tank or lust as they call it, that was left in place as a tier two site closure. We found evidence of that. And then there was other kind of unknown chemicals in barrels and other things as we walked the site we saw evidence of, which made us believe that it met the blight factor of that. Um, so that's really the presentation today on the blight study and either Reed or myself are available for any questions that may uh, folks may have thank you okay thank you so i'm going to go ahead and open public comment as noted there were uh, multiple comments on lakewood speaks and so i have um, some more folks who signed up to echo that miss hasfjord you support the question yes do not wish to speak got that one uh miss maddie nichols is here and she supports and does not wish to speak but miss bagley you do wish to speak so come on down and Again, we'll give you your three minutes. When you're at 30 seconds, it'll go yellow. When you're up, it'll go red. If anybody wishes to speak to this item online, please raise your hand, star nine. Good evening, welcome. Good evening, thank you so much. 
Hi, my name is Ashley Bagley. I'm here tonight both as a resident of Ward 2 and co-chair of one of Ward 2's neighborhood associations, Two Creeks Neighborhood Organization, also known as TCNO. Specifically, I want to express my support and TCNO's support for the blight designations under review by City Council this evening at 1325 J Street. I also have with me, I emailed it to City Council earlier today, but I do have with me the letter of support from TCNO as well as a petition of support for the, the blight designation signed by 64 Two Creeks residents. Again, all in support of the blight designation. We have an incredibly unique opportunity before us tonight. The blight designation of a large parcel of land that has the potential to transform the Two Creeks neighborhood. This development would serve as a destination on the W line, a gateway to the West Colfax Quarter and the Two Creeks neighborhood that I call home. With such a large parcel under consideration, this also means the rare opportunity for a thoughtful, cohesive design on the site. I'm particularly excited by the developer's plans to include a partial for sale component, a workforce housing program, and local shops centric design. The developer has proactively started conversations with TCNO, and we look forward to partnering with them on this important project. And we're also thrilled that this project would address the long-standing floodplain issues that impact nearly two-thirds of the site. Before I wrap up, I'd like to leave you with a thought about choices <laughs> between two different futures for the sites on the agenda this evening. In one, Council grants the blight designation and paves the way for an exciting redevelopment of Lakewood's historic brickyard and adjacent warehouses. We remember what was with the brick house, a sculpture at Lamar Station, and thoughtful elements incorporated into the final design. And we work together to create a transit-centered gateway to the West Colfax Corridor, including with the brickyard company owners. In the other future, we have an unaddressed floodplain continued air quality and noise issues from a, big, a brickyard that's right in the middle, an otherwise pretty quiet neighborhood, and an incredibly uncertain future for this plot of land. So tonight, will you choose the bright and brilliant future that will attract more young couples and families to the area, like myself, or an uncertain future for a brickyard? I hope you choose the bright and brilliant one. We really want to see change for the better happen in Ward 2. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you very much. And Mr. Senior, you are here in support, but not wishing to speak. So thank you for coming out. That exhausts my list of folks in chambers who wish to speak. Anybody else? Okay. Anybody online wish to weigh in on this item? Okay. Seeing none, I will now close public comment. And council, I'm happy to entertain questions first. Okay. Councilor Springsteen. Hi, Mr. Challen. I, I know we've spoken before and I, I just wanted to start by saying I am always trying to be respectful of presenters, just asking questions and questioning the process is not intended to be disrespectful to you. And so I would hope that you would not take it that way. That's my job to question our process, to question your process. Um, for oh, this oh, so, so I just want to start with that, that always being respectful of you, just trying to ask questions that I think my constituents would. And while, so um, I grew up just about a mile down from this historic brickyard and my parents were in construction on our own house when I was growing up. So I remember my dad taking me to watch the brick making process at this place. It's a very distinct memory in my mind. So I have a pretty good idea about this property and what, what it is. Um, while I am not necessarily, um, I mean, I guess my, my main concern 
just for the public who is interested in blighting this is that um, what what the developers are promoting, we need to make sure they will do. We need some kind of assurances of that. We need assurances that they will make affordable housing, that they will not pay cash in lieu of parkland, um, that sort of thing. Otherwise, just blighting things without assurances doesn't do us any good. One, one of the things that really stood out about my your presentation that concerned me we have been talking about a lot, a lot about the homeless uh, pro uh, problems that we're facing in Lakewood. And you brought that up as part of the blight, as an unsanitary, unsafe condition. And what concerns me is the precedent that that sets in terms of the blighting that we are doing, that that, that has now become a criteria for blighting when we have homeless issues in many, many areas of the city. Um, but if that's gonna become a criteria for blighting, that makes me very, very concerned. Um, and so I would like to hear more about that from you. Um, as you know, I've always thought that this list of criteria is very strange because you can find blighting in sort of any situation, is my opinion. Um, and that's too bad because there are situations that call for it and situations that don't. But when you're saying um, this is an 11 and a half acre site that has no, that has no sidewalks, um, that has an issue with accessibility. I mean, this was a business. This was a big site. I remember the big piles of um, whatever the materials they used for brick, they would, they would always put on the site and build up the mountain and then it, it would be depleted. And so, I mean, it was just a business. So that's why there's no extensive utilities on it. That's why there's no streets. That's why there's only one access. So I'm confused why that is a blighting issue. That doesn't make sense to me. And maybe you can explain that to me. Um, and then, you know, we have this situation where um, well, and I can speak more to this later, but we have a resolution defining blight, but resolutions are only supposed to be in place for a year. And so we're sort of going off of this definition of blight that isn't even part of the ordinance. Um, but, you know, one of the questions I've asked you in each of these cases, and I would ask you again tonight, just to point out to the public, again, not to be disrespectful of you or your, or your company, but just to point out to the public that this is a stacked deck in every situation. How many of these situations were you, have you been hired where you did not find blight? How much were you paid to do this study? And by whom? The um, property owner themselves. So I'd like to ask you those questions again, just to make a point to the public. And I am not saying that I, you know, that this might not be a situation where we could have some development, but I am saying that if we're gonna do that, we need some assurances that it's going to be utilized the way that we are being told. So we need to put something in place to make sure we have affordable housing out of it, that we get parkland out of it, and um, and we ensure that, that the developer is, is gonna do what they say they're gonna do. 
So, all right, food for thought. Thank you, Mr. Chellen. I hope <laughs> that was respectful. I meant to be, thank you. Mr. Chellen, if you want to speak to the blight issues, certainly I think a couple of those other ones sure. are certainly pertaining quite quite Yeah, let me yeah, let me share the um, screen again if I may. Maybe. Oops. So I think I want to make sure uh, Ms. Springsteen I get all the questions right. So I think what you asked me about was the uh, faulty or inadequate street layout? Is that the one that you were asking about and how it's applied? Yeah, that was one because all over Lakewood, we don't have sidewalks, for instance. Sure. So how do you identify what is and is not? Sure, well, so to go back to the criteria that we follow, the criteria is um, fairly clear um, faulty lot, I think it's C is what we're talking about here, it's B rather. Um, predominance of defective or inadequate street layout. And so you're, you're not wrong in what you're saying in, in that many larger sites that are currently undeveloped or being used as singular use will um, fall under this blight factor. That is not a wrong statement. And so the fact that 14th does not have curb and gutter, does not have adequate drainage, does not have proper protections for pedestrians. And the fact that this is an 11 and a half acre site that is a single user with many of the things we spoke about earlier, um, it's not unique to this site. Any 11 and a half acre site more than likely, or many times, I should say, not more than likely, many times would uh, be found to have blight on them. That's not a wrong statement. So I think I can concur with what you're saying there. Can you um, clarify for me the second question you had? You, Thank you, went you. Back, Yeah, you went back and forth a little bit on land use, and I will share with you this is not intended to talk about land use. This right. Is, this is on blight, and so right. there will be, assuming Reed and his team get through this process in a way that, that works for their pro forma, and they decide to then develop, they will then come back before, I assume, in some form or fashion, to talk about what the intended land use is. I'm not here to talk about intended land use. I'm just here to talk about blight. I understand. Okay. And that was kind of an aside, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's okay. I just wanna make sure I answer all your questions. So can you clarify for me what your second question was, please? And then we can get to the how much and how many. You can do that. So I, I had a big, big, big concern about um, uh, the reference to homelessness. Oh, Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's so part of blight because if if we declare everywhere there's a homeless encampment blighted, um I could see problems with that. Fair, fair fair enough. I don't that is not the only singular reason for us finding the unsanitary or unsafe conditions. It is just one of the um items we identified as we walk the site. And as, as I mentioned during the presentation, there had been a, a, a fire um, in that area due to the, by the homeless folks. So that is not the sole reason for meeting this unsanitary or unsafe conditions. It's just one of several that we saw. So it's not, a, it's not the, the reason, it is a reason, just to clarify. Okay. Um, and then you talked about inaccessibility, mm -hmm. which, um, Again, you know, it was a business. So of course it's gonna have one accessible way in. So why is that a blight factor? Again, it's one of the factors of blight. And, and if you were to, to zoom out and look at a similar sized parcel and maybe another municipality um, that had a similar use with similar infrastructure challenges in the area, that too may be considered blight. And so it is one of the factors that we evaluate as we determine whether a site is blighted or not. But, but what you said before about like an 11 and a half acre site, this would not be unique to this property It, if it was something that was used for business you might find that in, in many of mm -hmm. the, these kinds of sites. 
Yeah, again, not wrong um, in what you're saying. It, it is a factor of light, though. Okay. And then the, the, the last thing that I had just, this, this is to educate the public more than anything else about these blight designations. And it's not specific to your company. It's, it's about the designations and just how many of these sorts of studies have you been hired for where you did not find blight? Sure. And what are you paid and by whom? Yeah, so we are hired typically by um, either Uber, Uber, yeah, excuse me, urban renewal agencies or authorities, URAs. We do a fair bit of life studies for URAs. We are hired in Lakewood specifically by potential developers of parcels. And so we were hired by a potential developer of this parcel um, and to see if this was blighted or not. And from a cost perspective, what we charge, we charge, you know, somewhere between five and $8,000, depending upon the study and what we're doing, whether we're giving a presentation like this, or if we just turn in a blight study to a URA and the URA takes that and moves that through council action. So Matrix has done a lot of these blight studies. I can't tell you how many, but in the history of the firm, we're a 20, we'll be a 23 year old firm here this year. And we've done a lot of blight studies. Um, how many have we not found blight? I would, I would suggest to you that we probably never completed a report that we didn't find blight. And what I mean by that is we would go out into the field, look for the 11 factors of blight, come back and tell our client, hey, we didn't find any blight, and the project stops there. And we, they pay us the you know, couple of nickels that we charge them to go out to the site. And so we don't we have not that I can think of gone through and finished a report that did not find blight after doing the field uh, work that we, we do to see if they have blight or not. Um, I don't think we've ever finished one that says, hey, there's no blight here, because there's no reason to, quite frankly. A URA wouldn't take it to council if it didn't say blight to get a TIF district, as an example. A client like Reed, who I think is in the audience today, he wouldn't take, uh, say we didn't find blight here, he wouldn't have paid us to write a report that says, hey, I don't have blight, and then have me come present to the city council to say, hey, we don't have blight. This just wouldn't happen. And so um, hopefully that answers your question. Well, I guess what percentage then would you turn back like that and say, this is not going to be a blight situation? I don't, you know, I don't know off the top of my head. I think um, I've been doing development for what, 25, 26 years now, and I think all the easy sites are gone. So um, as we continue to look at different parcels, either through a URA or through, you know, individual developers like Mr. Reed here, um, I'm not sure there are too many out there that are not blighted, but I don't know that for sure. I'm not, I don't, I don't have a number on how many matrix has not wrapped up, but I know there are some, but many times clients are sophisticated enough to know if it's going to meet blight as well. They need a professional like matrix or Rickard Cunningham or whomever to come in and and uh, confirm that. I, I guess that doesn't really answer my question though. Like what, to, to give me an idea, I mean, you're saying pretty much 100% is gonna be found blighted if on the initial findings, you think it's gonna be found blighted. But I'm trying to get an idea of a, a tiny bit different, Ms. Springsy. What I'm saying to you is that we have professionals as part of our company who can go out and, and they do the field work required to support blight studies. And that is a you know couple day effort to go out and walk in buildings, make notes. After that couple of day effort, they, they know whether they saw blight or not. And if they did not see blight, we stop the project. We tell the client, hey, you don't have blight. Um, let's, why don't you look at other funding mechanisms or other approaches that's what and, that, and that's the percentage i'm trying to get to is i don't what, i don't know i don't have a percentage i'm sorry okay and to answer another question resolutions do not expire in a year so just to clarify that and you know what's before us is blight but there are also questions of what is or what could be and i know that the owner and the owner's rep are also here and mr davis i don't know if you wanted to address 
any of that question or some that may come down the road, please. Good evening, thank you for having me. Um, th this is something that we're extremely excited about and have been involved in the neighborhood for the last five years or so. So we're, we're committed to being involved in the neighborhood for the foreseeable future. Um, I used to be a, a resident of Two Creeks, outgrew my house, so we moved, but have stayed active with the community um, as well as the, the Neighborhood Association and have invested heavily in the area and want to continue to do that for the foreseeable future as well. Um, there's a lot of concerns about you know the, the spot blighting or whatever you want to call it, but honestly, it's our path forward to mitigate risk for a two to three year endeavor to figure out what we actually have specifically on the, the Lakewood Brick site. I've I developed the project across the street from the Lakewood Brick site. We have another project in in the queue with Lakewood right now that we hope to begin construction on relatively soon. We purchased 138 workforce housing units and made significant investment in that, that community as well with art, with renovations. We want to find the right mix. Um, we're not going to please everybody. We know that. But we feel like this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to create something that one day the city could look back on and point, point to and say, this is exactly what we want for development. It's a large scale development. We're not displacing residential units. Jim Welty, one of the owners is actually here and we, we've built a great relationship. They wanna build or they wanna invest with us um, in the deal. This is gonna be a five, 10 year situation. Um, their ability to operate at this location is, is becoming more and more difficult. Uh, right in the middle of a, a neighborhood directly adjacent to a light rail stop. We understand um, and, and he's willing to speak if, if you want to hear from him as well, but they fully support it. The site uh, no longer makes sense for their operations. It's ex increasingly difficult and impractical for them to operate. They're aligned with us. They want to see appropriate development continue. Uh, Blight allows, like I said earlier, for us to attract investment, spend the necessary dollars to uncover what we, what we don't know at this point. Um, understandably, the city could potentially lose control or, or that's the thought that people perceive. So honestly, we're, we're willing to make the following commitments to set the stage for the future and collaborate with the stakeholders that are involved in the community. One of them being we, we truly want to create a neighborhood hub that emphasizes local retail, community gathering space and public realm. We've engaged a, mat, a world worldwide master planner that's local. Uh, their, their name is Civitas and they really focus on shared vision. They don't just take, take on jobs that they want to do just to earn a dollar. Um, they're really focused on the public realm and creating that, that gathering space. Selfishly, when I lived in the neighborhood, I wanted to go or have somewhere to go that I could take my kids, feel safe, infrastructures around so I can walk on the sidewalks. There's, there's safety components, lighting, connectivity with 40 West. Uh, 40 West has done a fantastic job spearheading the West Colfax vision. And I think this would potentially speed up that program as well. Uh, so, so one, we want to create a, a neighborhood hub. And right now, we have a plan for 30 to 50,000 feet of neighborhood centric retail. We would love to stay away from national retailers. We'd love to have the you know local brewery, coffee shops, ice cream shops, et cetera, along with open space where people can come and spend spend the entire day, spend the weekend, whatever, and and hopefully one day people on council could look back and say, yeah, it's a great spot to go. We'd love that. We're committed to holding regular update meetings with the neighborhood stakeholders and Ward Two. 
if any council members want to be involved, we're more than open to, to doing that as well. And number three, adding the, the connectivity and infrastructure that allows the site that allows the site to serve as the gateway to West Colfax and the 40 West Arts District from Lamar Station. We truly believe it could be kind of the front door uh, to West Colfax. And again, kind of having the cohesive component of a site this large, we'd love to create design standards that protect the, the cohesive uh, project vision regardless of changes in ownership. Jim Welty's here. We would love to incorporate brick heavily in the project and are committed to, to making that happen. Uh, we want to maintain appropriate residential density with thoughtful design standards and mix of housing options as, as Patrick pointed out, or Ashley pointed out, for sale, workforce housing, market rate apartments, et cetera. We don't want to overdo it. We don't want to rezone to get extra height, to add extra density, and we feel like collaboratively with the city, with the neighborhood, with the arts district, we can make it happen. We have to take a ton of risk. If we're able to, to achieve a yes vote tonight, it will allow us to do that. We have proposals from civil engineers to explore the site that are in the two to $3 million range. That's extremely risky if we don't have any ability to do what we're talking about tonight. So I'm open to questions from anybody. I'm, I'm, I understand, like I said earlier, that not gonna please everybody Construct, construction is disruptive to neighborhoods for you know certain periods of time. I, I don't discount that at all, and willing to work with anybody who wants to work with us, positively or negatively. Great, thank you. And maybe just sit tight. We have a, a couple hands up, so if you want to sit yep. close, and uh, I appreciate that perspective, even though it's challenging because really, again, we're here with blight. Right. But there's also this idea of what else could be or how and. And maybe after tonight, this gets us to a different conversation of how do we ensure things like this can be memorialized moving forward. But again, just to emphasize, we're talking blight, but that helps paint a little bit more of the picture. So I have um, Councillor Abel, then Mayak Guerrero, and then Jansen. Uh, I would prefer, Mayor, that the uh, Councilwoman from Ward 2 go first. It's, she, this involves her... Ward. I think she yielded the floor to you, so go ahead, my friend. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, the subject of land use was just broached. And there are other things that need to be said about it. We're looking at a blight designation, but it's being justified by a, few, a proposed land use. We have a bunch of folks from the neighborhood that are quite aware of the proposed land use, and that was part of their reason for support. You're shaking your head no? Oh, no, the body here is to look at blood. Thank you. Yeah, the, so, different what the community had said. No, the community in their comments tonight are, are on... Uh, Correct, uh, sir. Our Lakewood, job is different from the community. That's all I'm saying. Please Lakewood go ahead. Lakewood Speaks... The community has spoken to the proposed land use, and I understand that, and I, I understand why they like that proposed land use. We have in the past uh, approved things for anticipating one land use and it becoming another. So um, my overall look at this is if we approved the blight designation tonight. I would like to have some kind of uh, documentation of what is planned. And, and we have had a number of these things that have been put together and blight declared. And uh, we have something other than what we expected. Uh, in fact, in a lot of these, we have nothing yet. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chalen, uh, blight designations are, de are um, allowed in order to cure blight. I'm wondering 
how much of this blight, you, well, for one thing, the inadequate street layout. How are you going to cure that? Isn't that something the city would have to cure? Through, I mean, I mean, I can answer that through proper planning and civil engineering, we would come up with the best best way to one mitigate the flood plan, which is sixty to uh, seventy percent of the site, that's which another. also allows us to build in the street grid and or propose other private drives or or whatever mm -hmm. that that could connect from Lamar Street to the west, Harlan to the east, and really have a pedestrian connectivity also to the Lamar Station platform. So you would be taking care of that? We would be yes, okay. spearheading that. Yeah. That's, that's the whole point with what I'm talking about, with taking, mitigating the risk, allowing us to go spend substantial dollars to explore it further and come up with the best, best plan that's appropriate for the community, the mm -hmm. city, okay. the neighborhood. Um, you mentioned the floodplain. Um, One of our city's first workshops ever with city council had to do, it was the first, had to do with the North Dry Gulch floodplain and how it would be remedied and why. And we asked why. And Jay Hutchison, our uh, recently retired uh, public works director, said, well, it's, it, we want to do this so we can lift properties up out, out of the floodplain, like Lakewood Brick, he mentioned specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, lift it out of the floodplain in order to increase its marketability. Uh, I, don't, I don't think the appearance of Lakewood Brick is, is an asset for the community, and just about anything would... Uh, brighten up that piece of the world uh, and the possibilities for use that I've heard are pretty good however is that combined with this blight designation and I'm not I don't have my eyes closed I know that a lot of folks are using the blight designation to get out of the requirement that they be subject to oversight by the City Council if it's more than 40 units and that it meet an unmet community need I think that is key uh, otherwise there are a lot of these things that exist on the site because of the use of the site and the intentional uh, acts of the owner of Lakewood Brick. So I'm a little concerned that self-made blight becomes self-declared blight and then becomes exempt from some of our uh, land use requirements. Um, but like I say, this, this particular corner of the world needs a lot of help. Uh, can you tell me how you would cure, for instance, a, uh, the land being unsuitable for development or being Mitigating the floodplain? Well, well so, floodplain and, and the topography. Right. So there, there's roughly a 15-foot grade drop from 14th to the light rail, which could be beneficial or not. It could be used as a slope to get underground parking, make it more efficient. That's one thing. The big thing, as we've talked about, is the floodplain. The city has looked into this quite a bit. As you said, we have studies from Mueller Engineering that kind of conceptually lay out reach one or reach four to reach one and specifically call out reach one TBD when Lakewood Brick is redeveloped. So in a, in a way, it gives us the ability to study it further, come up with the best possible solution for it and either look at a closed channel system with box culverts or open channel system. We've already looked into the open channel system. It's not as attractive as people might think it is. 
It would be 100 feet wide and 15 foot deep with concrete walls on the side, which could potentially be an issue for a lot of reasons, but um, both options were outlined in the conceptual report that we have. Um, and I think that, again, having the ability to move forward and spend the dollars we need to and engage the consultants that we need for that undertaking is substantial and this blight designation gives us the ability to do that thoughtfully and with sustainability in mind and you know creating the community need as you mentioned and that can be defined in many different ways but i think having a gathering space for the public at a transit oriented stop in a gateway to an art district in a area as you said that needs help this is the way to do it and we're committed to actively keeping whoever wants to be involved involved throughout the process i, I, I know you've heard it before and i understand your concerns we are heavily invested in the community we hold our projects for 10 plus years maybe even we never sell them we've invested close to 200 million dollars within a two block radius and and your comment still needs we need a lot more and we're willing to come in and privately look at a lot of different things that that you might get wary of of others but we're in the neighborhood for the long haul and whether you like it or not we're there and we want to make a difference we want to create something that's cohesive like, like I mentioned earlier, having design standards potentially embedded in our major site plan, if it's approved, if we're not around to own it, the next person's gonna be held to that standard. That's what we wanna to commit to. My questions don't mean that I like it or not. Right. Thank you. you. Like I said, I think anything will be an improvement there. I wish you hadn't mentioned the flood plane work you plan to do because that Sounds like it's contrary to what this council decided to do a couple of years ago and haven't quite gotten to yet, and that's a closed <laughs> flood controls, drainage control system. So would your... Say that again, they, they want closed or do not want closed? Uh, we, we were planning on a closed system. That's what we prefer. Okay. That's what I'm saying. The open channel is, is something that would honestly could be a disaster, could be, yeah. you know, liability issues, safety okay. concerns, unattractive trash sure. gathering pit, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It's okay. not, a, it's definitely something, like I said, in that report, it had two different options, very conceptual, but it kind of outlines what, okay. what makes the most sense. I misheard you, but wouldn't we be doing that work? Well, that, that's technically not in the budget from what i understand for the next 40 plus years and that's what i'm saying like we could jump start that and come in with private dollars and have it half a decade earlier than it's potentially could be implemented sure and we appreciate that one of the problems on covax so is the different fixes people have put in and they don't yeah. all mesh together and it, it well, can I mean, this, this will be heavily but. explored designed properly sure. and would go through you know, city engineering right. and public works as as any other project would oh, and i wasn't aware it's going to be 30 years before we get around to it i believe we were talking about a bond issue to hasten well, things along but that, we're right, open, any work you're willing to do we're, to we're save us to the expense and the time i'm interested in thank you thank you councilor matt guerrero and then councilor jansen thank you so much um and I, I do really apologize that I can't could not be there in person this evening. Um, I would I would love love to be there to have this conversation because of course as you all know this the, both these properties are and the one that we're discussing now and the one that's actually in our both in my ward and so I'm really familiar with the property and I <clears throat> I do want to highlight you know it seems like there is general agreement that that site makes sense to be something else. Um, and just to again reiterate that it is in a place that is now a neighborhood, a residential neighborhood, which is different than how the, the brickyard was first um, put in place. 
and it's on the light rail, like very, very close, just across the street from a light rail stop. And so um, that there is sort of, if we're going to be really be talking about land use, I think all of these questions about floodplains and the light rail and the neighborhood are really important. Um, but of course we're not, right? We're talking about whether or not it's blighted and it seems incredibly clear that based on the definition, working definition of flight that we have at this moment, it is blighted. And so I will say we are extremely lucky that we have a developer who wants to be committed to the neighborhood, who wants to make something that fits in with the design and character of the area, that wants to make a destination for and to collaborate with the arts district uh, to make it make sense for the city, to make it make sense with the light rail, to make it make sense with the neighborhood, to think about um, attainable housing or workforce housing, affordable housing, open space and sustainability issues. That's extremely lucky because I think for me, looking at this, it's very clear that like the the, the definition of white is that I have to vote yes on this as white. And I'm extremely pleased that then I like the potential plan, right? Um, it makes me think too about a discussion that we were having really centered on affordable housing and, and the SGI a couple of weeks ago and just the need to really evaluate the way that now that we've got a couple of years under our belt with the SGI, like, is this actually the way to be negotiating and thinking about developments? Um, and maybe that maybe this is a good catalyst of that conversation that's like, well, how, how what are the other ways that we're gonna um, ensure that we're able to hold developers to as high a standard as I know Reed here will hold, hold himself and hold his company to. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a little bit of an aside, but I did just want to be incredibly clear that like this area absolutely makes sense to be blighted. It is in a neighborhood that um, has really benefited actually from work of this company. I used to work, I used to live right on 13th and Lamar, so we just kitty corner from this state. And so I'm extremely familiar with this area. And so I will be voting in favor of this plate, but I, I wanted to just kind of like bring that up as well as something we should continue to all be thinking about is this is a very specific case where the bike makes the most sense and the project seems like it will be a very good project. Um, and those things are lucky that they are aligned at this moment. It makes it feel more straightforward to me for today. Um, and I'm excited to keep talking about uh, what we want development to look like in Lakewood beyond this project. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Jansen. Thank you. Um, like an, Ms. Uh, Councillor Springsteen, my dad used to go to Lakewood Brick and get bricks and make walls and do all kinds of things. Um, my husband and I also purchased an old property. And if we had blight back then, it would have been really blighted. <laughs> In fact, they probably could find blight there now. Um, and, and and you did answer my question. I, my question was on the, the drainage. So thank you for that. Yeah. I, that that would be great if it could get done like that. Um, the way that it was blighted, I, I I'm still having a hard time with that, especially the homeless thing. I that's what kind of turned me off about that right now. It just because it's now, oh now if we have homeless camps, it's going to be blighted. I didn't like that. So that's a that's one part that I'm having issues with, um, and also. Um, the private property rights, I really, I'm struggling with that because I, I, I agree with you. You know, it's, you know, you want to buy something and get, do something with it. And I think it's a great idea. Um, I'm a little conflicted at this point. So just so you know, I'm, I'm kind of both we're, sides. We're partnering with the owner who wants to be involved. And, I, and honestly, I don't think it's, the property's not for sale, would not have been for sale. Okay. Oh, the prop, the owners in, in the owners this. in the room right oh, here. Oh, got it. Okay. So I, I reached out about a year ago just to gauge interest. And I think the only reason that Jim and his family got comfortable is because we wanted to include them in the investment for the foreseeable future. We want them to be in, at the, at the table. We want to be transparent throughout the process with them. And that's kind of where it came back to like, the legacy of the Welty family, the legacy of the Murray family, who've been involved in this site for 100 years or more. You have a operator in the business that was 14 years old, got dropped off 
on a rail stop, I believe, on Colfax at the time and walked over and started working in the brickyard at 14. He still operates the, the plant today. He's 60 plus years old and um, has been an integral part of the operation, involved heavily in the community. And again, there, it, it's not as efficient as it once was, operating costs are higher, et cetera. The only reason they they want to partner with us is because they know what we've done in the neighborhood and we want to be transparent with them throughout the process and include them and and almost leave a legacy, pay homage to the history, incorporate brick, incorporate the Welty name, the Murray name, and honestly, I don't think others would have the, the same opportunity we potentially have if we didn't give them a seat at the table like we did. And we're excited, and I think that's extremely exciting to have them at the table, and to have them willing to trust us and kind of move, the, move the ball down the field and perform for them as well. And that's kind of what I like about Lakewood is, or I, there's certain things I hate when they just take things down that used to be there. You know, I've lived here my whole life, and you know, to see see something like that just be demolished, I don't want to see that. I want to see parts of it still be be part of it so it's not gone, you know? So that's kind of what I'm hoping you guys can that's do. That's 100% what we're committed to. All right. I mean, we, we don't want to cut costs in lieu of, you know, brick in lieu of stucco. We don't yeah. want that. And I hate this blight thing, just so you know. I, I hate to do it. I'm not the biggest fan either, but. <laughs> All right, uh, Councillor Vincent, then Strom. Okay. I deliberately did not say anything originally because I have worked with you before. So maybe I, I should uh, disclose that because everything you've done has been in my ward. I get ownership of that. Can you tell? Um, also, too, I don't like this whole blight thing. And selfishly, I guess it's because it's always been in, in my ward. But it's, it's the place that has the blight. I'm, that's just what it is. And I appreciate... Um, Mr. Chellen, just sticking to that and and knowing that it is not our our blight information. It is information that comes down from the state. They're the ones who decided it, whether we like it or not. Um, so I have um, it's blighted, period, over and out. It's been a business forever, um, and it's had problems forever. And um, so naturally, I support it because it is blighted. Um, but just in case anybody wonders, since I have worked with this person before, um, he has put over $100,000 worth of art um, right there on 14th, which he didn't have to do, and left it as affordable housing or workforce housing. So um, I guess that's basically all I wanted to say. I wanted to give everybody else a chance to say something before I did, because it should be all about us. Great, thank you. Councilor Strom, Councilor Stowers, I. Thank you. I'd like to start by saying I really appreciate you know, you're all patient with our process. It's not easy here in Lakewood. Um, I understand the intent behind it, but thank you very much for that. And thank you for wanting to be so invested in our community. While I live in Ward 5, which is the southernmost part of Lakewood, I have gone up there to kind of tour the area, get a really good feel of what's going on. And I definitely see um, so many opportunities and especially hearing more about your vision. Again, I know this is more, this is about blight. This isn't land use, but I appreciate hearing that. I look at this, um, I mean, it's, it's pretty cut and dry. This is the process, even the strategic growth initiative, the purpose and intent was encouraging redevelopment of blighted and distressed areas. This is what we're talking about here tonight. And as Councillor Vincent mentioned, this is a state standard process. This isn't something that we created. We are utilizing something that's already in place. Four items are required, seven items are found. To me, the math is there and um, I do hope that, well, and I think for us as a council body, one of the things that we could look at is if we wanna address how we are developing these larger parcels of land and adding some layers of assurance to the community, I do think that we should take that on as well. Cause this is, I mean, we're opening up a lot of questions and we're trusting you. And I appreciate the, 
the backstory and the pre-involvement that you've had and the trust that's coming from our community already. So that's really, um, it's just a big positive of all that. But I do think that's something that we as a council owe, owe to the community, the community that voted the strategic growth initiative in. And um, I hope that as you guys, should this pass tonight and you do move forward, there were a number of comments that were on our liquid speed system that really did ask for things like workforce housing for parks. I said, you know, we were talking about buying parks just a few weeks ago. I feel very fortunate in Ward 5. We are the one I would say probably has the most park. <laughs> like we are a significant amount of park and Ward 2 needs more. So keeping that in mind and then also um, addressing purchase options. Um, you know, I have been in financial services for over 20 years and I know that being able to purchase a home is a way that families can start to build wealth and really create a financial future for themselves. So it does hurt me to see apartments after apartments after apartments and know that these are more families that are not getting that opportunity. So I hope that you build that in there. And there was also one public comment that did mention that it's essential to have the oversight and public input, that that should be available throughout the process. So I appreciate you mentioning that that will be. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Great, thank you. Councilor Sharazai, then Springsteen, then Abel. Um, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, I, so a couple points that have just been reinforced. You know, as a newer council member and having spent the last two years watching council meetings and seeing the debate around, you know, when spotlight comes up, you know, we can only go on what the definition is. And so I would just reinforce the point that was just made. And then with Councilor Vincent, this meets that definition. And so we can debate you know, a number of other things, but I, I think what we're being asked to determine here today is blight. So I appreciate the, the work that went into that and educating us in that process as well. And I appreciate hearing from the community. You know, it's hard for me to um, balance opinions of people who live in established neighborhoods far removed from this area for them to weigh in on what they think we should be seeing in this community. And when we see the folks from Two Creeks coming in who are directly impacted and speaking very highly of this, I know this debate is not a about land use and it is about blight, but some, this in the past I feel as though councils maybe thought that nothing is better than something because we've held a fast line on this. And I hope that our council now can, you know, remain committed to consistency and not moving the, the goalposts. So we know these are the definitions of blight. As Councillor Strom mentioned, four are needed, seven were met in this. And so to me, this meets what is needed to move this conversation forward. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Councilor Springsteen, then Abel. I wonder if you're willing to commit to us that 25% of this project will be committed to affordable housing and that you will not do a cash in lieu of parkland payout that's my first question and i have more after that but can you commit that to us no I, I mean i told you what i would commit to and i'm I'll, I'll i'll be as transparent as possible and will not commit to a certain number or a percentage of anything for all we know it could be a million square feet of commercial office per your zoning. Would I want to do that? Absolutely not. Will I? No, but I'm not, I can't commit to 25% affordable. Well, I didn't, I, I honestly didn't hear any commitment to any affordable or attainable housing. Is that a correct assessment? I said I would commit to exploring all, all options when it comes to, to residential housing. Yes. We're, we, we would ex explore attainable, workforce, for sale, and market rate apartments. You would explore that, but would you provide any? Would I, yes, I'll commit to that. We will but provide- But not 25%. Not, I'm not gonna, I mean, we don't know what we have on the site yet. We have to explore the 11 and a half acres that 60% of the, the site's taken up by a floodplain. So if we're unable to mitigate the floodplain as we think we are or can, then maybe that number goes from X percent down to Y percent. We don't know. That's what I'm saying. The ability 
to move the ball down the field or to move forward and spend the, the type of money that goes into this. And, and to make it clear, this does not de-risk what we're doing. There's substantial risk moving forward for the next two, three, five plus years. And this is a small step in the right direction that we're willing to commit to a component of for sale, a component of attainable housing or workforce housing and market rate residential. Okay. And we're, we're, we're committed to providing pedestrian connectivity from the light rail, which in a sense could be your, your open space or, or parkland gathering, gathering space, 30 to 50,000 plus square feet of commercial in a, in a um, area that is walkable, that promotes outdoor, indoor use and provides the ability for people in the neighborhood and the community and Lakewood as a whole as to create a destination. That's, that's what I'm committed to and, and willing to commit to today. What, will you commit to no cash in lieu of parkland? I don't think that, I think we changed the rules on that. I don't think on a site that large, he can not do cash in lieu. I think he has to do land dedication counselor. We'll follow whatever's in place on the administrative side when we go through site plan approval, which is a extremely arduous process and. Okay, and regardless of what the rules are or are not, will you commit to no cash in lieu of providing parkland? To answer your question, no, I will not commit to that because it's not even appropriate to ask. Why, why is that not appropriate to ask? Okay. That, that's been a complaint among many constituents is that big developers are not setting aside parkland. They are paying cash right. to get rid of that requirement. And I'm asking you if you w would commit to us that you won't do that. I'm not going to commit to that, but I will commit to providing the public realm and a community gathering space that essentially takes up 30% of the site. Three to four acres on an 11 and a half acre site is substantial. That's what I'm committed to, to, to offer. And it's not even an offer. I'm committed to making it happen. I want to, I want to see it happen. Density is an issue with, with the neighborhood. People don't necessarily want stuff slammed in. We understand that and we're sensitive to that. And we understand that we're not trying to rezone. We're trying to create something special for the Lakewood as a whole, Two Creeks neighborhood, the district, and I think we can achieve that, but I'm not willing to commit that we're not gonna do fee and lieu for parkland. Okay. Well, so, I mean, the bottom line for me, and I mean, this, this sounds like people who are committed and embedded in the community but the issue is not so much that the issue is um is this definition of blight a moving target and um what what are we talking about here tonight are we talking about oh this sounds like this wonderful thing that we would really like in that part of the community and um, if these gentlemen are going to follow through on what they're talking about, it would be wonderful for that community. Um, but that's not what we're supposed to be deciding on. And it's a dangerous precedent to set. We need better definitions of what light is. Um, some of you all on council who say that you're concerned about the homeless issue, and then you're gonna decide on something uh, that isn't even part of the blight designation, that there are homeless encampments, and that so therefore it's blighted. I mean, that that is hypocrisy. <laughs> that is a contradiction in terms. We have no assurances is the problem. We could declare this blighted, and, and, and I'm not picking on this particular set of developers. I mean, they may have very good intentions, but what I am saying is we need to look at the big picture. 
And so anyone who wants something declared blighted can pay their five to eight thousand dollars to Mr. Challen and get it declared blighted. And there is no assurance to us, you have heard tonight, that we're gonna get any affordable housing out of it, that we're gonna get um, parkland in lieu of cash. They have said to you specifically, they will not commit to that. And so, you know, just sort of jumping on this bandwagon without having assurances is, is not responsible in my opinion. And so what I really think we should do as a council is to better um, shore up that definition of blight, to make it part of the ordinance, not a resolution, um, to, um, you know, I, I mean, even Mr. Challen agreed with me that you have, um, Councilor, we have we have a bunch of hands up. Could you get to a question, or can we come back? There's some folks who haven't had a chance to speak. Please. No, I can go as long as I need to go. Um, okay, if you, you could just be a, respectful of your council you members, a, please. We understand your point, but if you, you have, have a question, a that'd be fantastic. I have the floor, Mayor. I have the floor. Correct, but I'm the chair, and I'd ask you to please wrap up your questions for this round. Thank you. So you have a, a situation where Mr. Challen agreed with us that some of the blight definitions of properties like this could apply to any property of 11.5 acres. Now that's not a very specific definition in my opinion. And so, you know, I, I, I think there's two separate issues we're getting at is this a blighted property or are we declaring it a bright, blighted property just because we're kind of buying into some of these promises that are being made and how do we avoid doing that without getting sort of hoodwinked on the back end because the the bottom line is we could declare it blighted and it could be sold to another developer tomorrow who doesn't do any of these things that are being promised. And beyond that, they're not even making promises for affordable housing, which is what some of you folks say that you want. So what are we doing here? We need to fix this somehow. Councilor Abel. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I have some similar concerns. You know, we have no guarantees, but we rarely do anyway. Uh, but at some point, we're talking about the blight study. Uh, I've seen the Lakewood Brick property. It's, it's a good candidate. If you like the mix of reds and yellows and yeah, big piles and little piles, uh, but it has been important to our city for a long time. But it, the point I was going to make at some point, um, in a process like this, the cart comes before the horse. And this gentleman is telling us that that horse is going to be suitable and that we're all going to enjoy the ride. Uh, I have no reason to doubt that. I would warn you, though, that there are some folks over here that have some expectations about this property. And if they're not, if those expectations aren't met, then you have some formidable foes. Absolutely. So. Yeah, I think you do understand that, and, and I think you do have a commitment to our community. And while I do not like this particular uh, blight resolution, uh, I have in the past voted for a place that was clearly blighted because to say it's not would have been just uh, disingenuous. So I believe this property is blighted. I think you're a gentleman of your word. 
Um, we have other folks that have long commitments to our community and so has their family. Uh, so I will reluctantly be voting for this because it is blighted, but please keep your word because you know, I, I know you can't tell us how many affordable you might be able to do now or what retail might go in there. But I think a third of the site being left for community use as open space is very generous. Uh, I will trust you on, on, on that as well because I, I think it would be a, a big step. And if you dedicate a third of that site I don't think you, there would be any fees in lieu left to pay. I do want to say, though, that isn't it 14 acres at which the cutoff comes, but it is not the developer's choice of whether to pay the fee in lieu. It's staff's choice. So this is a little bit under that, but wow, three, four acres. Uh, We're excited to share our progress once we're able to share our progress. And We've already shared it with the neighborhood, high level. But we're, yeah, like right. I said, we're committed to being transparent. As sometimes that gets me in trouble being yeah. too transparent, but yeah. that's I, who I am and I want that to be known. Well, and I think you know who not to cross. Yeah, and, I, and if, <laughs> exactly. So, okay. Thank I you. Will, uh, I'll be voting for this. Councilor Jansen, then Councilor Matt Guerrero, then I'm going to ask for a motion, please. I have a real quick question. Did you say market rate on the housing? I said all of them. Market rate on everything. Market rate, for sale, workforce. Everything. Okay, thanks. Councilor Matt Guerrero. Um, I, I will keep it very quick because I, I think that people have heard sort of what they need to. Um, but just to just to reiterate that, you know, I I don't disagree that homeless camps alone is not something that you get to consider be, being blighted. And I just wanted to really specifically address that what we're actually looking at right is all of the variables and then how many need to be um, true for an area to be blighted under the current definition believe that is seven and we reached 11 with this particular property and um, obviously many of us are incredibly familiar with the area and so just again want to reiterate that there some of these some of this conversation around whether or not this is the right and appropriate way to address blight and to address development in Lakewood and if maybe we as a council after today should really dig in and look at the ways that we can be maximizing our open space and be maximizing um, our affordable and attainable housing and be really ensuring that we are holding developers to the standard that is really being put before us today. Um, I would love to have that conversation. I don't think that that's um, been subtle that I want to have that conversation. And so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have anything else to say on this, um, but that I, I do hope that we revisit that soon. I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, motion please. Yes, I move for the adoption of resolution 2022-37. Second. Motion second, any other comments? Okay, I'll just quickly summarize a, a couple of things and I'll be brief, but um, Again, what I tried not to get into, but it's hard not to, is this piece and that piece, right? And this is, again, something that this council created to come before us to deal with the strategic growth initiative, which talked about blighted areas. And I think you're almost surrounded by blight in that property, and there's a reason why that probably wasn't included in the urban renewal at one time when it most likely might have been drawn in in some areas. So um, our process is broken it doesn't take into account the fact that multi-year large parcel projects need better definition for the investors but also for the community and so i certainly want to echo and i've said this before i'd be happy to get rid of the blight designation i mean when i tell people that we do spot spot blighting i mean nobody's ever seen or heard of that in their life but it 
affords an opportunity to really look at areas which the SGI says to reinvigorate blighted areas and some of those are not in the standard. So I welcome us going forward to look at that. I would really encourage you to continue to engage not only with the community, not to say that you won't, but find ways that we can memorialize some of this and yep. work with you and, and let this be as an example to the rest of the community of something that's really special, one of the largest potential parcels that we've had in some time in a really uh, up and coming and an area that people have been waiting to see stuff. I see Maddie and Kathy back there for a long time. So <laughs> there's Maddie's. Maddie said, get it done. So those are my comments. I will note that Councillor Oliver was with us. Okay. And he did, he did move off. This will not be an official vote, but he did indicate that he would not be supportive. But that vote does not count as he's not with us at this time and he's coming from a challenged area with internet. So I'll wait to call it and just double check. Is that correct? He's not. Okay. So there's a motion a second. Please cast your votes. Councillor Over texted me. He he is rebooting right now. Okay. He's getting back on. So please cast your votes. Yes. Okay. And that passes. Let me lock him out. Nine eyes, one nay, the nay being Councillor Springsteen. And just to clarify, non officially, Councillor Oliver had reached out to say he was a no. Okay. Thank you. The clerk, please read item 10. Item 10, resolution 2022-38, approving a chapter 14.27 blight designation pursuant to chapter 1427 of the Lakewood Municipal Code for the properties located at 1315 and 1341 Lamar Street in Lakewood, Colorado. Deja vu, Mr. Smith. <laughs> sure we can. I, I'm just hoping to avoid the nickname Mr. Blight. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I get the privilege Certainly of Certainly how you drew this straw, I'm not sure, but. <laughs> I, uh, I, I get the pleasure of introducing these and helping uh, uh, facilitate the process, and I very much enjoy that. But um, the long and the short of it is is that uh, this is the process, and we'll, we'll go through it one more time here with this particular process. So before the council is resolution 2022-38, it concerns a 1427 blight designation consideration for the properties at 1315 and 1341 Lamar Street, very near to the uh, one that we just worked with. Um, uh, we'll have the consultant run through the main points of the blight study. That again is Mr. Chellen with uh, Matrix Engineering, uh, or excuse me, Matrix Design Group. Um, the uh, process for the 1427 uh, blight designation is nearly identical to the to the uh, to the um, uh, urban renewal process, with a few differences. Uh, the conditions and blight survey are were in your packet. Um, they reference both resolution 2020-7 and 2020-24, um, which the council approved in 2020, um, regarding uh, helping define blight for the purposes of chapter 1427. And again, 1427 is the way in which the uh, SGI or the strategic growth initiative was incorporated into the Lakewood Municipal Court. So again, a, uh, there is a table in the uh, middle of that report talks about 11 items that they have to answer in their affirmative here. As I mentioned uh, last time, I didn't go over all of them. Uh, I won't go over all of them again. I'll just uh, uh, mention one of them in the uh, 11. All of them have to say yes. So, you know, where the properties and owners informed council will review the evidence presented at the public hearing to determine uh, if a blight designation is appropriate for the property in alignment with the following factors, length of time that the property has been vacant or deteriorated, reasons for the vacancy, so on and so forth. Um, you can read the entirety of that uh, packet, but that's part of uh, 2024, 2020. Uh, 2020- Dash 24, and that yes is the answer to that one in this particular case. In this particular case, these properties uh, were again seven uh, state-defined blighting elements were defined here, um, and you can go through uh, those as well. Um, they're very much listed in the table that's in that report uh, on there. Uh, one of them, uh, you know, conditions that endanger life or property by fire or other causes, uh, is one of the uh, one of the 11 that was found in this particular case. Uh, this property currently has three connected manufacturing buildings on it, spanning both parcels of land. Two of the facilities are currently vacant. 
The northernmost building is currently occupied by a poly tank manufacturing facility. Historically, the buildings have been used for many industrial purposes, including a plastics fabricator, a graphics company, medical supply distributor, uh, several other uses. Uh, the project is exploring potential redevelopment opportunities um, that would follow the current zoning regulations and city code. Um, the project would uh, bring potentially additional development, additional infrastructure, potential neighborhood serving amenities and jobs. Uh, sites located near various modes of transportation, including RTD routes, bike routes, trail access, and other active transit uh, options. Study area is just under 350 feet from the established Lakewood West Colfax corridor uh, urban renewal area. The Lamar stop uh, on the uh, along the, the Lamar station stop along the W line is just under 235 feet from this particular project. Uh, area or property area. Uh, the property is adjacent to the 40 West Art Line. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, it's part of the Colorado Enterprise Zone. We talked about that a little earlier. Federal Opportunity Zone, a CDBG area, and a low income housing tax credit census tract. The uh, property uh, is found to have the 7 of 11 uh, blight factors. The presence of at least four is required for the under the state law for urban renewal areas and for this 1427 blight designation. Uh, all of the descriptions of those blight factors and the way in which this project uh, was reviewed for those blight factors is contained in the report. Um, and I'll quickly add that the uh, property, if it does receive a 1427 blight designation, it won't change the zoning or grant additional zoning entitlements to the property, they'll have to develop under that that uh, that zoning requirement. Uh, I did review the Lakewood Speaks website for the this item a little earlier today. There were eight comments and eight commenters. Uh, in this case, nobody uh, did a couple of them. One directly did not support the blight designation. Uh, uh, five were in direct support of the blight designation, and there were two that uh, supported redevelopment in general without directly stating a position on the blight designation, just as we talked about before. So with that, I'll reintroduce uh, Mr. Patrick Chellen with the Matrix uh, Design Group. Uh, and again, they will uh, go, go over the uh, conditions for this particular property. Uh, and again, the Matrix folks were the folks that were involved with the 2005 condition survey that allowed for the uh, Lakewood Reinvestment Authority area being declared back there in 2005. So again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Uh, Patrick Chellen with Matrix Design Group. All right, thank you, Mr. Chellen, good evening. Good evening, thank you everyone. Uh, thanks Robert for the introduction. So thought I would start with an overall map similar to the last one we just gave. So this is the Summit Brick property that we just spoke of. The blight study that we also did was for 1315 North Lamar which is this uh, demarcated building on the west side of Lamar. The presentation that I'll give to you, if I may. Um, again, this is, the, this is Lamar Street. This is the RTD station. This is the industrial building uh, that is just on the west side of Lamar. Uh, we talked about this in the last presentation. The 1% growth cap has a blight exception for structures located or to be located upon land that is designated as blighted. Uh, blighted is defined by the Colorado Urban Renewal Statutes here, and the goal of today is to determine if this study area meets the definition of blight per the Urban Renewal Statutes. Um, there are 11 factors of blight that we evaluated as we looked at this property. Uh, Robert shared this, but we found seven factors of blight, a little bit different uh, seven than the last property that we just looked at, some of them are the same. I'll go through each one and describe how and why we found blight of each one. So the first one is slum deteriorated or deteriorating structures. And so as we evaluate the three spaces, there's pretty obvious evidence that the building is old and dilapidated and deteriorating. It's in need of some uh, significant improvements to uh, keep operating. Uh, B, which is predominance of defective or inadequate street layout. Lamar Street, as I mentioned, is a minor collector that's supposed to carry up to 7,000 vehicles per day. It's currently less than 30 feet wide and the, the Lakewood standards are 36 feet wide. It is supposed to have curb and gutter, sidewalk, and other pedestrian protections of which there are none. Uh, there is not really the ability for this property to use Lamar other than to pull in and back out into, um, into Lamar Street, which goes against Lakewood standards. 
Uh, the next one that we evaluate is faulty lot layout in relation to size, adequacy, accessibility, and usefulness. This is really all about the, the reason that we found blight on this one is really about the access. Um, there is not sufficient room for parking to this building, but there's dock loading that you can see in this middle picture and this picture here, which doesn't really allow for any parking. Um, the, the picture that you see here on the far left shows where people do park, but that blocks the ability to utilize the dock high loading. Uh, the next blight factor was unsanitary or unsafe conditions. The study area, as we evaluated on the information available to us, is an elevated area of, of crime, rather, and they've been documented issues of gang violence, drive-by shootings, and constant graffiti. Those are the reasoning for finding unsanitary, unsafe conditions. Uh, the next one we reviewed was deterioration of site and other improvements. As we walked around, there was evidence of handrails that were breaking off on stoops. Pavement had, had basically eroded away and was no longer in place. There was a lot of a lot so probably a, there was a number of areas that had um, just storage strewn around fences that were falling apart little to no landscaping on the property that you'd expect to see um, so that was a reason we found uh, deterioration of site and other improvements uh, f was unusual topography or inadequate public improvements or utilities talked about lamar street before no curb and gutter inadequate drainage along there will need to be rectified in the future no sidewalks curb and gutter these um, overhead utilities were potentially problematic depending on where access may be needed should the site redevelopment those are the reasons we found blight on uh, this particular factor and then the last one that we found was substantial physical underutilization or vacancy of sites buildings or improvements so this is a a large 24,300 square foot building that has 20,000 square feet that is currently vacant and unused, telling us that um, the vacancy rate at 30, or pardon me, 83% tells us that it is underutilized and is currently vacant. So um, that was the last blight factor that we found. And that concludes the presentation. And Miguel, for any questions. Great, thank you. I'll now go to public comment. Uh, Mr. Senior has left, but he does favor the project and Ashley you want to come back down and give us two choices <laughs> I'm back <laughs> <laughs> hi I'm Ashley same Ashley from before <laughs> uh, TCNO co-chair I just wanted to again express a support for the blight designation while we are of course very excited for the redevelopment plans that are being talked about we do believe this area is blighted this property does not go on the list of the most exciting places to take visitors in town. We'll just say it that way. <laughs> um, but in all seriousness, I think it seems from my standpoint that it meets the blight criteria. And again, we're very excited for the potential future plans, but it's not a great place to walk by, not some place that I would walk alone <laughs> um, or with my dog, especially at night. So there you have it. Thank you so much. Remember the two choices. You have yes. two. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, anybody online or anybody else in chambers wish to speak? Star nine. Okay, I'll go ahead and close public comment. Go to questions. Councillor Abel. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this one does raise a few more questions with me. Uh, some of these conditions seem to be not quite a fit with the regulation. Uh, the blight study cites overhead utilities. State blight uh, regulations refer to inadequate utilities. I don't think overhead utility lines necessarily mean they're inadequate. Deteriorated structures. If so, then the property owner let them deteriorate. Uh, requirement for curb and gutter. Do we have a requirement for curb and gutter? My street doesn't have curb and gutter. Dozens of streets don't have curb and gutter. So are they really required? 
I yeah, believe so, but I would need to check with the um, engineering folks to make sure. But whenever there's a new development, the developer is responsible for providing the curb and gutter. All right, but we're talking about an old development that doesn't have curb and gutter. And whether that's improper, I guess, would be the way to put it. Uh, inadequate lot layout. How do you change the lot layout here, Mr. Chalin? How do you cure that? I mean, this, this looks like a fairly regular lot to me. Why is it, what's the fault with its layout? It's the, uh, it's faulty lot layout relation to size, accuracy, accessibility, and usefulness. And so the current site does not allow for on street, or uh, pardon me, on site parking, nor does it have good access from Lamar onto the site. Both of these. Found this as, as blight. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Both of these uh, buildings have parking lots, asphalt parking lots. I was there this morning. You can pull into the uh, both properties on the asphalt they have. One it's of them very, is very limited. We, well, the way that we reviewed it, it was less than five vehicles that could fit in there. And so for a 24,300 square foot building, that is inadequate in our opinion. Uh, you cite an uh, unusual uh, number of police and fire calls to the site. How many? I don't know the top off my head, sir. What would be uh, what would be considered not unusual number? Well, if you see the heat map here, this heat map highlights. Can you see my screen, sir? I'll see the map. Yeah, so what the heat map shows is areas, higher areas of crime. The red ones are the hottest, yellow, next step down, greens, which this is in a green, which we would consider an unsafe area. Well, it is defined as an unsafe area. Okay, which, which color is the site? Green, sir. I would prefer to have numbers. It's a lot easier to quantify. Uh, have there been any code violations issued in this area or in the on this site, either of the two properties? If, if that's aimed at me, sir, I'm not sure. That'd have to come from city staff. Pardon? If that question is aimed to me, I am not sure and you would need to aim that at city staff, I'm okay. not sure. Well, um, I think a lot of these things would be contrary to code if they uh, are in fact extant. And the picture I'm looking at here is, uh, shows the street and it shows a big mud or water drainage problem on the street in the bicycle lane. That's not on the site, though. The uh, the blight factor F is unusual topography or inadequate public improvements or utilities. So our review of that is if there's drainage problems in the area that need to be rectified by putting curb and gutter and other drainage, that is inadequate public improvements. Well, and and you, you mentioned the overhead utilities. Uh, the, the phrase the state uses is inadequate. What makes overhead utilities be inadequate? I think it's, it's, probably 90% of the city has overhead utilities. Sure. What, the way that we reviewed it, sir, was that it's potentially developmental prohibitive to have overhead utilities in front of a site like this, meaning it may prevent access points or other things that may want to be utilized during redevelopment. Is Excel aware that these are inadequate utilities? The word, I'm, I'm not, just to be clear, I'm not using the word inadequate. I'm using the word potentially developmentally prohibitive is the words I'm using. 
Well, it's the state requires it. It's inadequate under the state's uh, terminology. Uh, one of my other concerns, the biggest concern I have is that we declared 1350 Lamar a blighted property and it's being constructed right now, but as part of the project, it appears that there is a one of Lakewood's uh, probably few remaining uh, attainable or affordable houses was leveled uh, in the process of that. And I noted that there are a number of, I guess they're duplexes or triplexes that are immediately west of us, the south end of these, this project here on the street behind it. Are those uh, anticipated to be part of this project? Are you looking to buy those up and tear them down as well? Or would that be, are they, not part of the plan. They are not currently in this study area, sir. They're not currently in the study area. Are you telling me that? My question is, do you anticipate or does the developer anticipate buying those homes those, uh, and then tearing them down for gentrification? I don't know the answer to that, sir. Sir, please. Okay, we'll have the chair call people down. Please. Okay, well, he asked and he was looking okay. at me and I didn't want to be rude. Well, that's all right. So we, we own the industrial building, the property to the west, like you talked about, the vacant lot at 1347 Lamar, and then 1354 Marshall. So those, the... The so duplexes, the are they duplexes? I think there's eight eight units. Yeah, and are you talking about that? Those being taken down and becoming part of this other project? Comprehensively, we we look at this almost as one with the brickyard, but yes, we would be potentially redeveloping the whole site. So this, the west side, which is Marshall Street, all down the mar. So we will be losing affordability well, in some I, I measure. I wouldn't, the existing units, potentially, yes, but this gives us the ability, honestly, as comprehensive plan, to include a lot more attainable units. So you're doing this project as well? And 1350, the one you just spoke of about two two houses being knocked down, which were t actually a landscaping business and a, another home. A home. I don't. I mean, the home the with the graffiti that had been on the shed in the backyard. I guess, yeah. I guess so. Yeah. But to answer like one of the crime issue or comments you had, it's a day. It was nonstop every single day. We'd have to have called the Lakewood Police Department and or kick people out who broke into the, the homes, the duplexes, and it's been ongoing until we were able to obtain a demolition permit like two weeks ago for that 1350 site. Okay, and but the uh, other site on Marshall, what's the The other address? site on Marshall was, what's the address demo, I think it's 1354, but we had people break in, they were cooking fentanyl, they were changing locks, they were cutting, uh, cutting uh, locks with bolt cutters on the fence. Just not every single day we had to deal with it. Well, I don't think people are going to change your behavior, their behavior because you're... Well, they're not going to anywhere to... But my concern is it. that we're losing affordability, affordable homes in order for this to come up. I appreciate that I you say that. we're going to add affordable homes. Will you at least uh, go for as far as to say that you will replace the same number of affordable? Sure, but we're, in your we're talking about the industrial building, right? Well, we're talking about the uh, duplexes behind them on Marshall Street. Well, there's, I mean, people are still going to live there for the, 
foreseeable future. I mean, they it might be a year, it might be two years. Before but they're we coming can, down when you can start I give it just building. a point of clarification? Are those part of the blight? What we're talking no. about the duplexes? Okay. No, but he he. No, I it's, it's no, not, I'm just I to be transparent. And right. Say yes, we're the the plan is to redevelop the area. No, I appreciate the transparency. Yeah. I just want to make sure if I was hearing right, if those are part of this request or not. No, it, it's just. My, my questions are more of an overarching concern that we're gentrify, gentrifying without replacing affordability. And if we're going to replace affordability here, that's less of a concern. Yeah. My other problem is the uh, improper lot layout or, or the improper uh, terrain it's been built on before so why is it impo why does it impose such a constraint now as to be part of the blight designation for, for one site it does the fact that we own the other side makes a lot of sense to redevelop it with proper access the current zoning and and stuff on Lamar Street following exactly what the city lays out in zoning and and planning they want essentially no curb cuts on lamar street so in order to get a layout that makes sense you'd have to enter a parking deck off lamar street and now since we control marshall street it gives us the ability to access it and keep the the frontage along lamar street transparent with retail highlighting the corner at the light rail and like I said earlier it's kind of the whole vision that we talked about 30 minutes ago but this kind of is cohesive with along the same lines aside from one parcel that's adjacent to Lakewood Brick there are well, no one, one point of clarity with what Reed just said we when we evaluated the blight for this building we did not consider the duplexes to the west that was not in our thinking we only considered access and layout for that industrial building. Just I, to clarify. Un I understand, and I know that Correct. tonight what we're talking about is the parcel that uh, you want to declare blight on, but I have concerns that we have not yet lost affordable, or there's nothing really affordable in the city. Uh, but we've, we've not lost those more attainable uh, properties to blight designation until now. So, thank you. Okay, I have Councilor Springsteen and Councilor Vincent. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanna first point out that I am the only counselor tonight who has been interrupted and cut off by the mayor with my questions for whatever reason. Um, so, Mr. Challen, can you define old and dilapidated in need of improvements? Because I would say that probably applies to just about every structure in Lakewood. So can you be more specific and why that is different than other properties in Lakewood? And only speak to the property that we reviewed as part of this blight study and i believe the definitions are in the blight assessment the conditions assessment well that doesn't answer my question though what what is old and dilapidated to to you i don't have i don't have a definition for you i'm sorry it is in it's on page 10 and 11 of the conditions assessment which is neglected properties or evidence of general site maintenance problems, deteriorated signage or lighting, deteriorated fences, walls, or gates, deterioration of on-site parking surfaces, curb and gutter or sidewalks, poorly maintained landscaping or overgrown vegetation, poor parking lot, driveway layout, or unpaved parking lot on commercial properties. That is the def definition. But I mean, does that mean what specifically did you find at this site? Like, did it need a paint job or what? 
what what specifically for which blight factor i'm sorry for the old and dilapidated need of improvements so uh sorry so you're saying slum deteriorated or deteriorating structures is that the one you're asking about you said that it was old and dilapidated in need of improvements and that was a factor so i'm asking specifically what that was referring to so these are the blight blight factors that we found these seven which i'm sorry which one are you asking about These are the seven that we found highlighted on the page here. Deterioration of site or other improvements. Okay. So this is the one where we found deterioration of uh, steps and concrete, pavement and parking, lack of landscape and storage, fences that are falling down. That is what we found for this blight factor E. Lack of landscape, is that a factor? among the definition? Poorly maintained landscaping or overgrown vegetation is one of the factors in this. Okay, that's that's poorly maintained, right? But you're saying lack of, and this was a business, right? Well, well, I think you can see this picture here. I don't know if that's lack of or poorly maintained. I guess you could you could say it's either, right? Well, but I'm asking about the definition, I guess. Well, I read and it. And can you tell me what's wrong with that fence? I can't on the screen, no, I can't. But I can tell you that the storage and lack of landscape and poorly maintained landscape here was part of the reasoning that we found this light factor. So lack of landscape on somebody's property. So I have a neighbor who just put all rocks out so that they wouldn't have to water their grass. Would that fall under the definition of blight? No, Xeriscape would not. I would not expect that I have to review your neighbor's property, I guess. Okay. So um, you said there were 24,000 square feet, but not inadequate parking. And you said, quote, in our opinion. So well, yeah. We are hired to give our opinion and review the blight factors against this site. And it is our professional opinion, being experts in blight, that um, it met this blight factor. Yes, that's correct. That is what we are hired to give is our opinion. That there's in inadequate parking? Correct, that is one of the blight factors, accessibility and usefulness, correct. So you talked about gang violence. What? studies did you do on gang violence? I don't think we did any studies on gang violence. I think we used this heat map that's available through us through GIS to um, look at crime in the area. And in the heat map, it defines what that crime is. Well, you talked specifically about a drive-by shooting. Where did you get that information? I think the same source. How so? How is that in the map? It's um, admittedly, I didn't, I don't do this part of it. It comes out of our GIS group, but they're the ones who are able to go into the heat map and pick out for us the crime in the area. And then there is a um, key that goes with it. Would you agree that pretty much every area in Lakewood probably has had some kind of drive-by shooting sort of situation? No, I don't know that to be true or not. Hmm. We've had multiple drive-by shootings right up the street. Councilor Vincent can address that as it's her ward. Um, and then you talked about the dumpster not being locked. Is that a blight designation? It is potentially an unsanitary area if people are using it for un, un, um, or illegal public dumping, it can become. Uh, it is... Um, an anecdotal observation that we made, yes. Anecdotal, but not on the list, right? Well, unsan unsanitary and unsafe conditions, I can read that uh, 
if you care for me to do that, what that's defined as. Let me find it here. So you could blight a, a homeless campground, right? I'm not going to answer that. Why? There's no reason for me to. Well, I'm I'm a counselor asking you questions about a study to make a vote. So yeah, there is a reason to. He gave, he gave you his answer. He gave you his answer. Please proceed. Yeah, you're asking me to project on something that I have no idea. No, I'm asking about if we're going to make homelessness an unsanitary condition that leads to blight. That's what I, I'm asking. You didn't hear me talk about homelessness in this. Let me read for you what's in the unsanitary and unsafe conditions, if I may. So it's floodplains and flood prone areas, inadequate storm drainage systems, evidence of standing water, poor fire protection, fire prone areas or structures, above average incidences of public safety responses, inadequate sanitation or water systems, evidence of contaminants or hazard conditions or materials, high or unusual crime statistics, here's the one you'll like, open trash dumpsters, severely cracked, sloped or uneven surfaces for pedestrians, illegal dumping, vagrants, vandalism, and graffiti gang activity, and then open ditches, holes or trenches in pedestrian areas. So that is why we listed the trash. Does open trash dumpster mean like the top is open or it's unlocked? You could interpret it either way. We interpret it to be having the ability as well as we heard through um, feedback that there had been illegal dumping in the past. So we deem that a factor of blight. So, okay. Thank you, Mr. Chellen. I mean, again, council, they interpret it any way they want. And my concern with council is that you say you care about affordable housing and parkland, and yet you are not asking for assurances on these studies that that's what we're going to get, and that's a problem. That, that is my problem with these blight studies. We can fix it. We can find ways to fix it. But like Councillor Abel said, we're putting the cart before the horse. Thanks. Councillor Vincent. Yes, just real quick. I can address some of the issues or the questions that people have had. Um, there has been a lot of illegal dumping over there. It's, it's just, it's disgusting. It really is. People drive by and just dump it, and then it's somebody else's responsibility, supposedly, to clean it up. It is a high crime area. That is one thing that I get questions on uh, con consistently. There have been um, attacks over there, and I'm specifically talking about the uh, place between 13th and probably up to Colfax. There's, there's no lighting. Um, there's no sidewalks. People are expected to get off the light rail and walk two blocks. Um, there's been crack houses, and if they're not doing crack, then they're just breaking in and sleeping, and, and I guess we were talking about the illegal dumping, so they're defecating. We've had a business that has had to hose down their, um, their business because of the constant urination on there, and two days later, they had to call somebody back again. Um, it's, it's a bad area. You have somebody who's trying to do things, but as I have said, I know people get frustrated about the slow pace of things that move here, but if it makes anybody feel any better, for 11 years, I've been asking for street lights and sidewalks in that area. We threw in a light rail station and had nothing nothing there for support and this person is willing to come do that if we it's blighted if we don't declare it blighted we're still going to have attacks we're still going to have people who are robbed we're still going to have prostitution sometimes at the light rail station we are going to have illegal dumping where they come and just dump and run so we're going to consistently have these things and to me and and i'm not a math genius but if you 
if you have more affordable housing because you have a larger project, to me, that compensates for the possible four to eight that may be missing. Um, so if anybody has any questions, more questions about the crime, and yes, code enforcement has been called, and yes, I have called them over there, and yes, you can't back out of there because I've almost gotten creamed both walking and driving down there, so I can attest to that fact also. So if there's any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Councillor Franks, then Councillor Abel, and I'd like a motion, please. Um, thanks, Mayor Paul. I really just wanted to acknowledge Sharon and, and Councillor Vincent and, and her testimony. I used to take 14th to work um, prior, prior to COVID and uh, got to the point where I could not drive down that street without all the doors locked and finally uh, found another route. So I just wanted to acknowledge all, the, all that you said, and I know how heart-wrenching that is to have to describe your community that way. So I appreciate your testimony. Councillor Abel. Thank you, and I agree that uh, there's, this is a serious uh, area for crime, and I'm not sure that whatever we build over there is going to change that. Uh, the railroad is bringing uh, its own uh, miscreants with it, and uh, certainly this might make the place look a little prettier, but I don't think it's going to do anything about the crime rate. Thank you. Can I have a motion, please? Yes. Uh, Mayor Paul, I move for the adoption of Resolution 2022-38. A second. Motion and a second. Any more discussion? Seeing none, please cast your votes. Uh, Councillor Mayak Guerrero is a aye. Councillor Springsteen is a nay. And that is seven ayes, three nays. The nays being Springsteen, Jansen, and Abel. Thank you. General business, will the clerk please read uh, item eight back into the record? Item eight, approving minutes of city council meetings. Special meeting April 4th, 2022. Special meeting April 26th, 2022. Okay, can I have a motion, please? Mayor Paul, I move for the approval of the City Council minutes, as read into the record by the City Clerk. Thank you. <laughs> second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Councilor Springsteen? Yes, I, I, I'm not going to vote to approve these as I was excluded from these meetings i asked for a virtual option and none was provided and so i don't think these minutes should be approved okay please cast your votes those pass nine i one nay the nay being councillor springsteen okay general business councillor stewart Thank you. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, some of the general public comment that we received as well as acknowledge some emails and discussions I've had with several residents over the past month or so reaching out to me with concerns about water usage in our city as we are living in an increasingly dry and arid place. Um, and people are concerned that our residents need to have options for potential turf replacement and other water-wise landscaping options that we can utilize um, and support our residents in decreasing their residential water usage if they would like to do so. I just wanted to acknowledge those comments, acknowledge those residents who've reached out to me and just let you know that I have asked for some council action and that we will be discussing it at the next regular meeting. That's all. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Councilor Abel. I'm glad to hear that. I think uh, especially with as one of the commenters on uh, Lakewood Speaks said today that if we're going to be looking at uh, storage in Bear Creek um, an associated uh, issue is where does all the water come from and where does it all go? And if there is one limiting factor to the growth anywhere in the arid west, it's going to be how much water is available. 
we have as a state our there is a movement in uh, the state government to dewater the San Luis Valley so that we can have more bluegrass, I guess, in the Denver metro area. And we need to think about those folks in the San Luis Valley who, you know, what little water is remaining in those aquifers feed us and employ a number of folks right on the edge of sustenance living. So. We need to leave the water in the San Luis Valley so it can do more good for a wider group of people. The Arkansas River has been drained to an awful point. Uh, talk to the folks in Rocky Ford about that one. So I agree with you in anything that we can do to encourage the use of things like buffalo grass, which doesn't need water, um, zero scape and natural uh, vegetation I'm all for thank you and I'll I'll, I'll be your co-sponsor if you like okay anybody else in their general business okay we'll go ahead and go to reports Ward one please we had Ward one meeting uh, Saturday uh, it was in person and hopefully we're going to have many more, but we need to keep a wary eye on the uh, positivity rate for the virus. But uh, we, uh, we had a good, robust discussion. Thank you. Um, we're going to be hosting a Ward 1 meeting virtually on May 21st, and Trevor Wolfson from the Neighborhood Services Program is going to be sharing with community members so they can learn a little bit more about how to participate in that process. Cool. Thanks. Ward 2? Um, yes. First of all, um, I know this has been difficult conversations today, so I, I appreciate it. And I guess I'd just like to say from my own viewpoint, it's not easy for me to get up here and talk about all the horrible things that happen in my neighborhood. It's, it's very difficult. Um, but I'd really like to give a shout out to those people who got engaged. When I saw that there were 64 people just on a petition from all over the ward that signed up, plus another 37, if you would have told me my first go around in council that we would have had that kind of input i would have said no never so that speaks to the energy um uh, that this community i think is starting to have so i know i sounded a little choked up but it's very very hard <laughs> to sit here and talk about crime and and stuff so <laughs> so thank you all i know it's a difficult conversation and i appreciate the input Thanks. Councilor matt guerrero um, thank you, and thank you so much, Councillor Vincent, for that perspective. I also just want to echo the way that Ward 2 stepped up tonight and I think has been stepping up and, and showing up in a way that, honestly, that Ward hasn't um, for, a, for a long time. It's, it's very exciting, and I feel incredibly honored to be able to be a part of that. Um, and then that we do have a Ward meeting, um, not this coming Wednesday, but the following Wednesday. It's the third Wednesday of every month. Um, it is at the Clement Center. It is also on Zoom. You can find out more on the Lakewood City website, um, or I will be posting the um, usual Facebook event and update or updating the usual Facebook event that's recurring um, to reflect the agenda, which will include a speaker from Sprout, Sprout City Farm. They have a new farm director who will be attending, and then also um, an update and some conversation around where the Colfax Safety Project is at. Thank you. Thank you. Board three, Councilor Springsteen. Yes, I, I just wanted to announce a couple of um, publications regarding the uh, trial I talked about for Amir Allen uh, uh, that happened in Jefferson County a couple of weeks ago and that I won. He was a black man who claimed excessive force by LPD and um, he was acquitted by the jury. I wanted to, to mention that a jury member wants to help me in my fight for social and racial justice, which I think is wonderful. 
I don't know if I've ever heard of that kind of thing happening. Um, and I'm glad to see it uh, from this case. Um, and, and I really think that we haven't gotten credit for it, but I believe that the police body cams who we were originally told would roll out at the very last of the deadline in 2023 were rolled out a whole year early. And I really think that this case had a lot to do with that, um, even though we haven't gotten credit for that. Um, and I invite conversation about that with the police department. Uh, I would mention that we were in Colorado Newsline on this April 26th. And on Brother Jeff Fard's show, April 28th on Facebook, speaking our truth to power. Um, I would, I, I would neglected to congratulate the citizens um, uh, who stood up in the CCU uh, litigation and were really forced, uh, and Lenore Herskovitz spoke tonight, were really forced to get involved in this situation um, because they felt that the city was not doing its job to defend this case. And it's amazing the feat that they did. They really um, showed that the little guy, the citizen, um, these were people who were entering as interveners into this case because the whole story wasn't being told. Um, the citizen can really make a difference. And I, I want to congratulate them for all that they did in that regard. I wanted to mention that St. Jude's uh, parishioners are still getting in touch uh, by the dozens uh, asking for us to keep the road to garrison open that has been there for 50 years and expressing their concerns over this issue. This is one of the one of the biggest issues that I've seen of my constituents. And I, I really hope that the city will listen. And in that regard, it was implied that by my asking difficult questions of staff that I'm somehow being disrespectful. And I, I just want to set the record straight on that is that, you know, it is our job as counselors to ask staff difficult questions. That is what we're elected for. And that doesn't mean it's disrespectful. It means that we are fighting for transparency and fighting for, for our constituents. And so I don't want it to be painted that way. Thank you. Councilor Stewart. No report. <laughs> Word four. Thanks, Mayor Paul. And I wanted to acknowledge Councillor Stewart bringing up the water issue. I'm glad we're going to be having that conversation as someone who has fully zero scape. I have zero lawn at my house. Um, and I think it can still look quite lovely. I want to stress that it does not have to be something that's ugly. So I wanted to thank you for bringing that up and uh, look forward to that conversation. Um, I did want to uh, let folks know that we will be having the Ward 4 meeting this Saturday, 930 to 1030. It will be a virtual meeting and it's posted online on how to get onto the Zoom. Thanks. Ward 5. So we, we had our Ward 5 meeting and we had Lakewood Police Department come out and my uh, Commander Greenwell um, talked to us about the car theft. That was uh, pretty eye-opening. And um, yeah, we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> so that's all I've got. One interesting thing I took away from that Ward meeting was what 40% of crimes could not exist if we don't leave keys or key fobs in cars. It's a, a wonderful world. <laughs> not all crime, I am admitting, not all, but it was surprising how easy a decent amount could be avoided. Um, Councillor Jansen and I have also over the last couple of weeks enjoyed giving a couple of community updates to neighborhood associations and it just feels so good to be able to go out into the world and um, be able to share the work that we're doing and the work that we hope to do and answer questions and concerns. So we offer out the invitation for any other neighborhood associations in Ward 5 that would like to have us. And um, we are still working. Our upcoming ward meeting will be Saturday, June 4th. 
or is it June 5th, 4th or 5th? <laughs> We're still working on securing a topic for that meeting. Great, thank you. So where were you May 8th, 2017? Does anybody remember? I think, I think maybe some of us were here watching it come in. And that was the anniversary yesterday of the hailstorm that destroyed a lot of Lakewood and put out our largest tax generator for well over a year. And so it's pretty amazing when you think back of all the different obstacles that we have faced as a community and we've come together to overcome them. And who would have thought, you know, you'd never lived through something of that type of financial loss, making it through, and then we go through COVID, right? And another tremendous loss. So I say that to remember, you know, those out of tragedy and out of the darkness, we see light. But it's also a testament to our city manager, Kathy Hodson, and her team. And we had the opportunity to review her, our annual review tonight, and just want to thank you. Uh, I think it went really well, and uh, people are very excited about your job performance. You've been with us as city manager since 2009. And um, she provided with a, a just kind of not part and parcel to the review, but a, a list of everything staff has done over the last year and it was four pages single spaced with just project after project after project and so thank you so much and please thank your team through all the uh, adversity um, and all the ups and downs we continue to shine and i will say you know certainly our job is to ask tough questions but i like the phrase say what you mean but don't say it mean and um miss miss newland did a great job and it's also our job to be prepared and read packets and not you know ask questions that we should know or have read in that and then be upset when those aren't answered in a way that they should so i think that's important to mention i would also give a shout out to miss mckinney brown we talked a little bit about ccu you heard and we'll certainly get back to the community about those concerns but miss mckinney brown is actually the attorney that drafted all that and won that case on behalf of the city so an allegation that somehow we weren't doing everything we could. I don't know what else you could have done. You won. So it seems like you did a pretty rad job there. Got to plant some uh, trees at Belmar School of the Arts on Arbor Day with our, with our um, city folks. And we had two very special guests, one named Smokey the Bear and the other named Woodsy the Owl. And this is a testament. Not many kids knew who either were. And when we talk about trash in our community, and I'm gonna say some adults didn't know who Woodsy was, but uh, give a hoot, don't pollute, and the kids got a hoot out of that. But it's true, I mean, those are important characters I think that we all remember that really talked about protecting the environment that we love. So that was great. Stop by Mulholm Elementary. I know uh, Councilor Mayak Guerrero had been there recently as well. It's uh, another one of our impacted schools. They love it when council members are able to drop by some of those schools don't see a lot of a lot of folks and actually the staff really appreciate seeing city folks so if you're ever available please do many of us attended the um, west metro or the fallen fire fighters memorial on saturday it was packed i think they caught up on two years worth of folks to remember and it was quite powerful and uh, got to see a lot of different fire agencies on display Maddie Nichols was here, again, ordered, uh, organized the Colfax cleanup, 7.30 a.m. on Saturday morning. So thank you to those folks that showed up. Ugh. No $100 bills. Uh, no $100 bills. That's always, always amazing. Excuse and me, Mayor. I, I think you had it right to start with. She ordered it. She yes. ordered it. There you go. <laughs> And I know we joke, but you really haven't lived until you picked up trash on Colfax. <laughs> so, but uh, thank you, Maddie, and, and that whole team. You know, the marathon is this week, so look out for different tra or, uh, closings. And then I will close with the fact that we will have judge interviews next Monday evening at 5.30 p.m. at City Hall. Dinner will be available at 5. Our Chief Justice is um, retiring, and so... We have uh, three candidates that we'll be interviewing. With that, if there's nothing else, we will adjourn this meeting at <laughs> 945. <laughs>